Hi guys, this is Mrs. Foy and I'm going to give you a lecture today on just the introduction to the circulatory and respiratory systems. Um, I love this stuff. Um, I, this is what I did um, one of my master's degrees on and I just think it's fascinating um, and most people do too. So here we go. I hope you enjoy this. Um, so the purpose of the circulatory and the respiratory system, sometimes called the cardiovascular system, is it has to, it's a delivery system so that we can exchange materials with our cells, um, with the environment. So um, unicellular organisms like an amoeba or like a protist would be able to directly um, get oxygen in and carbon dioxide out and other waste products out and nutrients in and water's going to go back and forth. But multicellular organisms have to have a specialized system to do that. So this diagram is showing um, just some of those things that need to go in and out. And, and what we're going to see is diffusion. Concentration gradients are going to be the driving force that are going to transport these things in and out. And we'll talk later about how um, you have certain specialized carrying systems, for example, like the red blood cell um, has a protein called hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is going to actually carry oxygen and to some extent carbon dioxide back and forth. But a lot of these things are, are just um, dissolved uh, in the, um, the blood and um, are going to be uh, diffused out into the interstitial fluid. So remember there is fluid that is bathing all of these cells. And so waste products from these cells are going to be diffusing into the interstitial fluid and then back into the, um, the circulatory system and vice versa for things like glucose and oxygen. So, so we're going to be talking about, about how, these systems, um, how these systems do that. So when you have the simplest animal, so a sponge um, in the phylum periphera, um, you can hear that word pour. These are the simplest animals that we have, and they are multicellular, but um, they don't certainly don't have very many cells. And they they just have uh, water, seawater, and sometimes fresh water that comes in, and, and you have diffusion of oxygen and CO2, and uh, their filter feeders, nutrients um, from the uh, from the water right into the cells. By the time you get to the cnidarians. Um, you have a little bit more advanced body plans, but again, you can see that um, that we have more. You can see that there's going to be um, more super, uh, sorry, more surface area here, and um, we know that uh, structures like gills are going to be little tiny folds and fans. Again, increasing the surface area, and uh, terrestrial organisms have. Um, alveoli, which are little tiny, um, almost like tiny, tiny balloons that again increase the surface area. So um, you're going to see that different animals have different strategies um, from simple to complex, but, but all animals, all heterotrophs need to exchange um, with their environment. So in um, circulatory systems in multicellular animals, we have basically two times. We have open circulatory system and closed circulatory system. So in an open circulatory system, um, there is a kind of an area, I'm going to show you this, where um, lymph or, or blood is actually um, in kind of an open sinus. And there are, um, this is kind of bathing the, the cells that are in the area and um, an exchange occur, occurs there. So um, arthropods, like um, this insect, have little holes in their side called spiracles, and they um, have gas exchange that goes in through these tubes, and they have kind of kind of a, a tube-like heart um, that's going to uh, shunt the uh, the blood in a direction, but then it's open and, and this it's just bathed in the cells, and you can see a very distinct difference in a closed circulatory circulatory system which we see with annelids. Annelids are segmented worms and um, they are they have a true body coelom. If you remember where they are on the on the uh, animal um, phylogenetic tree they're up pretty close to the top and we can see in a closed circulatory system the blood never leaves either the chamber where it's being pumped which we call the heart or it never leaves um, the blood vessels 
and the blood vessels then branch smaller and smaller so that it can have, so it can reach every cell in the body um, directly. So that's a closed circulatory system. So we're going to focus now on the vertebrate circulatory system, and obviously we have a closed circulatory system, and the, um, our blood vessels have three main categories, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Um, and arteries are taking blood, the definition of an artery is uh, a, uh, uh, a blood vessel that is taking blood from the heart out to the tissues. So um, this picture is actually not showing an artery, I'll show you in a minute, but arteries are the largest um, they're actually, the diameter is not largest, but they are going to be carrying high pressure blood from the heart. And then we have um, a branching into smaller, what we call arterioles, and those further branch into capillaries, and those then fuse to form um, the other side of the blood vessels, which we call the, the, um, the deoxygenated side, the venule. Um, and then these flow into larger blood vessels called veins. So something I want to point out here is that we have these things called precapillary sphincters, um, and these are little um, kind of um, bands of smooth muscle that are, a sphincter is uh, something that uh, controls an opening, and these sphincters can be, they are under autonomic control, so it's not something that you can, um, that you can control, it's, they're made of smooth muscles, but what happens is, is that this is how the body can shunt blood to different parts of the body when it's needed. So for example, when you just eat a meal and you want to digest and carry, absorb those nutrients and carry away those nutrients, then the precapillary sphincters would be open to shunt blood um, to the digestive system and maybe they would be closed off to maybe some of your major muscle groups. Not closed off entirely, but closed down some. So the old wives tale about not exercising after a heavy meal is probably a good one because then you're giving the body two different signals. Do you want the blood shunted to your muscles? Do you want it shunted to your um, digestive system? And you can see that this color change from red to pink to kind of purple to blue is a pretty typical way that um, that teachers show the oxygen levels of um, of the blood in these vessels so this would be red would be highly oxygenated purple would be medium oxygenated levels and blue would be the lowest oxygenated levels so arteries are going to be very thick-walled um, vessels because they are um, carrying blood that is coming from the heart so it's at the highest pressure and you can see these different layers of tissue here They're, they both have smooth muscle um, tissues this endothelial cells this is going to be made of epithelial cells remember we remember that epithelial cells line all openings and this is the lining of a tube so that's going to be epithelial cells and then it's got a covering on the outside notice that the diameter in a vein is actually bigger than the diameter of an artery um, but that's because the blood in the vein is a very low pressure system and the the pressure in an artery is a high pressure system and so um, it's going to have a smaller diameter and it's going to have um, more tissue layers around it needs to be stronger but in a capillary, um, you have the thickness of a capillary wall is one cell thick. And you have specialized cells called endothelial cells, so you can see three of them here, make up the actual tube. They fold around and, f and form a tube, which is a capillary. Obviously, we want this to be very thin because we want diffusion to occur through there. So that makes sense. So this is showing all of the different types of vessels. So we have arteries coming from the heart, branching into arterioles, which are going to be smaller diameter, which branch into capillaries, and your precapillary sphincters would be here to be able to shunt blood from different capillary beds. Sometimes we call this a capillary bed. And this is where you are going to have um, exchange between tissues, body cells, and capillary systems. So, um, so in vertebrate systems, the way this is designed is that cells are never more than 
one cell away from a capillary um, because all cells need oxygen and they all need nutrients and they all produce carbon dioxide and they all produce waste products and so those things have to be um, transported so here the um, the blood is lower in oxygen it's going to be higher in waste products higher in co2 and it's going to be lower in nutrients and it flows back into venules which flow back into veins which go back to the heart so the heart and this is a vertebrate heart we're going to talk just a little bit about other types of heart but the heart a vertebrate heart is um, is broken into two or more chambers so two is going to be the least and four is going to be the most and four is the highest um, and the, um, the blood is going to enter through the atrium. This is a, a human heart and we have two. Um, and it is pumped then through uh, into the ventricles and the ventricles then are going to be the um, more muscular chambers. The, the right side of the heart is going to pump to the lungs and then the left side of the heart is going to pump to the rest of the body. So um, uh, fish, have a two-chambered heart. And in a two-chambered heart, they have blood going from their atria, atrium, to the vent, atria is plural for atrium, the atrium into the ventricle, and then it is going to go through a capillary bed in the gills. The gills is where it, you're going to pick up oxygen that has diffused in from the water. So you can see the blood is, is coming into the gill, low oxygenated, high CO2, and then you're going to have exchange occurring with the gills, and then on the other side of the gills, you're going to have high oxygen, low CO2, and then that highly oxygenated blood goes to the systemic circulation. That's going to be the systemic circulation would be the cells in the rest of the body of the fish, and the opposite is going to happen. So you would have the oxygen that was picked up in the gills being delivered to the cells um, in the fish's body, and CO2 would then be picked up and go back to the heart and then eventually to the, to the gills to be reoxygenated. Don't forget, this is not showing the digestive system. The digestive system is where you would have um, nutrients coming in, and it's not showing the excretory system where you would have waste products, so cellular waste, which would be um, excreted. So amphibians, reptiles, and mammals have what we call a double circulation. So we have oxygen-poor and oxygen-rich bloods are going to be on different sides of the heart. Um, and that's, that's the, obviously in advance of what fish do. Um, amphibians, which would be the, the least um, uh, of the three, these are going to be the, the most primitive, the least advanced is what I was going to say. These guys have a three-chambered heart. So they have two atria and one ventricle. And you can see how the blood is mixed in the ventricle, and that's not as efficient, but, you know, hey, it works pretty well. That was one of the first stabs of evolution to get a good heart. And in amphibians, because they live a dual life, living in the water and also on land, they have lung and skin capillaries. So they actually have gas exchange through their skin. Think of amphibians, right? They have very thin, slimy skin that's going to be wet. And they actually have gas exchange through their skin, which is one of the reasons why they are so vulnerable to environmental toxins. Um, and so then when you compare that to reptiles, reptiles um, have a more advanced, they have a septum that actually separates the ventricle into left and right sides. So it is a little bit more advanced heart, but they still have some, some um, mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood in another loop that, they, that we don't have here that makes them le least efficient. So birds and mammals have the most efficient circulatory system. We have a double pumping system um, and it keeps the pressure very high. Um, and we remember our endothermic organisms and so we are going to require, um, we have higher cellular respiration needs because we have um, a lot of um, energy is, is devoted to keeping our internal temperature the same and so we need more oxygen we need a better oxygen delivery system so um, this pulmonary circuit that we were talking about is going to pick up um, 
uh, blood and take it to the lungs, which is going to be oxygenated. Amphibians have a pulmos cutaneous, right? That's that lung skin circulatory system. And then the rest of the body, would be, we would call the systemic circulatory system. And um, interesting about amphibians, I did just talk about that, but um, when amphibians uh, go underwater, the blood flow to the lungs is, is shut off, and that, that makes sense, right? Interesting that crocodiles and alligators are, are higher, higher, um, the more advanced um, uh, hearts than turtles, snakes, and lizards. And, um, but, the, but as I said, the ultimate is birds and mammals with this four-chambered heart. So um, we're going to trace a drop of blood. This is something that I will expect you to know. So um, if you don't know this, I think it, there's a slides after this that actually go through, but I'm going to talk you through on this, on this picture. So if you don't um, get all the notes of what I'm saying, then you can check the next slide. So we're going to start in the right atrium. So blood comes into the right atrium from basically two major veins, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. We'll see these on our cat. And it goes into the right ventricle. Notice it's blue because it's coming from the body. So this is the venous side of the um, circulatory system. Goes into the right um, ventricle. And by the way, I should say right and left is always going to be the animal's right and left of the body. So if this, heart, if this picture was in my heart, this would be my right and my left side. So right ventricle then goes into um, a vein. This is, um, excuse me, this is an artery because it's leaving the heart, but it is the only artery in the body that carries um, deoxygenated blood. And now this is the pulmonary circuit. So these arteries are going to branch into arterioles, and then arterioles are going to branch into capillary beds, and they are going to be surrounded, these structures in the lung called alveoli, which is where gas exchange occurs, those little air sacs. And now we have the pulmonary vein. The pulmonary vein is the only vein in the body that carries oxygenated blood. So those two, this pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein are going to be counterintuitive than what arteries and veins are in the rest of the body because um, they're the opposite about oxygenated blood. But anyway, the pulmonary vein is carrying oxygenated blood back to the left atria. The blood goes through into the left ventricle. And now this is the systemic side. So the left side of the heart, the right side of the heart is the pulmonary circulation. And the left side of the heart is going to be the systemic circulation. So we would expect, and you'll see this when you look at a real heart, the left ventricle is much more muscular than the right ventricle. When that baby pumps, it's got to have enough pressure to get the blood throughout the whole body. So the blood is going to go out through the um, largest um, artery in the body called the aorta. And then the blood is going to be shunted to the upper and lower extremities um, into arteries and then arterioles and then to capillaries. So we have a capillaries in our um, head and limbs and we also have capillary beds down here showing in our abdominal organs and our hind limbs. And we're going to have gas exchange and nutrient exchange occurring there. Deoxygenated blood then flows into venules and then veins. And from the lower body, we have all of the venous blood going into the inferior vena cava. And all of the venous blood from the upper part of the body flows into the superior vena cava. And now we're back where we started from. So this, these are these slides where I've just talked to you about that. So now we need to talk about the valves um, because we need for blood to flow in one direction. And so um, I know um, in my grandmother's house, she used to have these really cool doors that would kind of um, almost like uh, those little um, folding doors that you see in like old time movies and bars and things where you could push and it would open. They wouldn't open going back the other way, but they would 
they would open going in one direction. So I think of that when I think of, of heart valves. So the function of a heart valve is to keep blood moving in one direction. So there are four valves, and you need to know the names of all four of these valves. So the valve, um, the, unfortunately, they have different names, unfortunately, but that's okay. We'll, we'll learn them. So there is a valve between the right atria and the right ventricle, which is an atrioventricular valve. And we have two atrioventricular valves because we have two openings between atria and ventricle. Here's one, and here's the other here. So, uh, I'm sorry, here's the other one right here, between the left atrium and the left ventricle. This one is called the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps. You'll see in the valve are three kind of like pie sections on it. Um, and so this is an atrioventricular valve that we call the tricuspid valve, and this is an atrioventricular valve that we call the bicuspid valve because it only has two of those. And then we have two valves from the exiting point of the blood from the ventricles into whatever chamber. So we call these the semilunar valves, um, and um, this one is called the pulmonary semilunar valve because it's going into, the blood is now going into the pulmonary circulation. And this valve, this semilunar valve right here, is often called the aortic valve because the blood is going into the aorta. So blood comes in from the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium through the tricuspid or atrioventricular valve into the right ventricle, goes through the ventricle, through the um, pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary circulation, the pulmonary artery. Notice the blood is still blue because it hasn't been oxygen, oxygenated yet. It's going to branch into pulmonary arterioles, capillary beds into the lungs, and then back through. These are the pulmonary veins coming from, coming to the heart, so they're veins, and there's four of them that branch into the um, left atrium, which goes, the blood then goes through the left atrioventricular valve, which we call the bicuspid valve, and then into the left ventricle, and it goes up through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta and then throughout the rest of the body. So the sound that you hear when you listen to um, the heart is actually the recoil of the blood against the AV valves. That's the lub. So we, we say that this is a lub-dub sound. And then the dub is the blood that recoils against the, um, the semilunar valves. And um, a skilled clinician can be able to tell from sound um, whether or not there is a defective valve. And we call that sound a heart murmur. And that's a, a, a red flag to a clinician that, that something may be wrong. Sometimes people have heart murmurs that, that, aren't, that aren't serious to their health. So we know that the heart is going to contract and relax in a certain rhythmic um, cycle. And um, if the heart does not contract in this rhythmic cycle, then um, we call that asystole, and asystole is when you see um, people with the shock paddles and they're trying to shock the heart to get it back into its cycle. But this cycle is called the cardiac cycle. And the contracting or the pumping phase is called systole, and the relaxation or the filling phase is called diastole. So it's very important for both. Obviously, you have to have pumping, but you have to have the heart relax because that's when the chambers fill. So if you were just pumping, 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 you would have, it would be inefficient because you wouldn't have a chance for the heart vessels to be filled. And so um, what happens is, is that the heart, the atria contract and then the ventricles contract. So the atrials contract together and the ventricles contract together. So here we see what is happening is that the semilunar valves are closed, the AV valves are open, and blood is then filling um, the, um, the chambers. And this is the atrial and ventricular diastole. They are both, for 0.4 seconds in a normal human cycle, both relaxed. So then what happens is that you have... Um, atrial systole 
and ventricle diastole. So what is happening here is that the atria are contracting. The atria are contracting and these AV valves are open and these semilunar valves stay shut. So then what happens is we have ventricular systole and atrial diastole. So now the ventricles contract and when they contract, the semilunar valves have to be open so blood can go into the pulmonary circulation and get into the lungs and it can go through the systemic circulation up through the aorta and now you have the AV valves closed to prevent backflow of the blood into the atria and then the cycle repeats itself. So the heart rate um, is also called the pulse and that is the number of beats of the heart per minute. The um, the recoil that you feel on your, on your radial artery, you can actually feel it lots of different places. You can feel it in your carotid artery. But that is the rebounding, the elasticity of the blood vessel when the ventricles contract, because that's when you have this big wall of blood that goes through. The stroke volume is the amount of blood that is pumped in a single contraction of the heart. And again, we're talking about ventricular contractions because that's what gets it out um, into the body. And the cardiac output um, is the volume of the blood per minute and the cardiac output is going to depend upon how much blood you're being pumped down in a single contraction but also how many times the heart is beating. So what's really cool about heart muscle cells themselves is that they are self-excitable. So what that means is, is that if you took a developing um, heart from, from an embryo and you teased out the heart cells themselves into a petri dish, they would all be contracting. They wouldn't be contracting as a unit, but they would be, they would be contracting. They are self-excitable. And we're going to see in just a minute that it takes um, a system, an electrical system, to get it all to pump together. Because if the heart pump in unison excitatory at the same time, then you're not going to get the muscles of the heart to beat at the same time and then you're not going to get the blood pumping. So one of the things that makes cardiac muscle different from smooth muscle and skeletal muscle um, is a couple different things. First of all, cardiac muscle is under, um, it is not under uh, voluntary control. You can't make your heart contract. So in that, it's very similar to smooth muscle, which is going to be the muscle that lines your the uterus and line blood uh, cells and lines your, I mean blood vessels, I'm sorry, and lines your digestive tract. We can't control that either. But cardiac muscle needs to, to contract in unison. And so one of the structure function um, things that are in cardiac muscle are these things called intercalated discs. And an intercalated disc is a specialized structure that contains desmosomes and gap junctions. So you might remember this back when we were talking about the cells. These are things that are going to allow intercellular communication. And these intercalated discs show up on cardiac muscle. You can see them. So if you're looking at them under a microscope, you see these little dark bands in between the muscle cells. And these intercalated discs are very important to help the heart beat together as a unit. And that's very important. So we have special tissues in the heart um, that we um, are the, that, that are going to be the things in the heart that are going to set the pace at which the cardiac muscles fire and then thus contract. And um, the two very important ones are the SA node, the sinoatrial node, which we call the pacemaker, and the atrial ventricular node. So the SA node, do I have a picture of the SA node someplace? I hope I do. Yeah. So the SA node is, is located kind of on this upper wall of the atria. And this is the electrical system of the heart. So this is all the electrical system of the heart now, but this is what sets the beat. So the, the SA node is going to um, be under autonomic control um, of your brain, um, but it is also influenced by a lot of different things. 
So it's influenced by hormones, it's influenced by nerves, it's influenced by body temperature and exercise, um, and it can, um, it can reset itself to different rates. So if this is def dysfunctional and doesn't work, then a lot of times people have to have an external pacemaker put in. And those used to be very large actually, but um, they're getting smaller and smaller if the SA node is, is not functioning the way it should. So anyway, the electricity, the impulse from the SA node is going to um, be sent to the AV node, which is in kind of the floor of the atria. And then the electrical sig signal then goes into um, what we call the bundle of Hiss, um, which branches into the left and right bundle branches. This is in the septum of the heart, which is this kind of um, separation between the left and right sides. And then the electrical impulse is further branched into these things called Purkinje fibers. So the electrical stimulation goes SA node to the AV node down to the bundle of Hiss, Purkinje fibers, and then out to the individual um, cells themselves. So did I miss something? Yeah. So this pattern of impulse through the cardiac cycle can be recorded um, by something called an EKG. And, um, and we're, we'll do this in class. We actually have little electrodes that we can put in certain places on the skin where you can pick up this electrical signal. And um, a skilled person can look at the electrical pattern of the depolarization, the electrical signals in the heart muscle to be able to make um, clinical um, decisions about the health of somebody's heart. So what happens is, is that um, the, the EKG is going to have a couple different sections. So we have this, this thing called a P wave, and then we have this big thing called a QRS complex, and then we have something called a T wave, okay? So P wave, QRS, and then a T wave. The P wave is the atrial depolarization. The QRS complex is the ventricular depolarization, and the T wave is the ventricular repolarization. So there's an electrical signal when those um, when that when those fibers repolarize. There is an atrial repolarization as well, but it is masked by the larger electrical event of the ventricular depolarization. So what this is going to look like is that the SA node fires and it's going to send a depolarization now to the AV node. And we start to see that when the AV node fires, we see this is a the this is the P wave. This is going to be the atrial depolarization. Now we see the the electro uh, electric current spreading through the bundle branches, the bundle of Hiss and the Purkinje fibers, and we begin to see depolarization of the ventricular parts. And then we would see repolarization of the atrial parts, which is being hidden here. And then this P wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. So I think that's a good place to stop. And we'll talk about blood pressure later. Hope you've liked this. See you in class.